Hi guys, Olive here. Here today to discuss my theory on why Anne Elliot, leading lady of Jane Austen's last completed novel, Persuasion, was able to be persuaded to call off her engagement to the love of her life, Captain Wentworth. It's an event we don't see in the book, since the events of this novel take place eight years after the fact. And even though it was a long time ago, and it's not often openly spoken about in the novel, it's still something that haunts both of the romantic leads. And throughout the book, it's the major factor in keeping those two apart. So it's a major source of tension. On the surface, the reasons why Anne turned down Wentworth after initially accepting him are pretty straightforward. After learning of her engagement, her father and her godmother were concerned about Wentworth's wealth, his prospects, his status within society, and convinced her to do so. Look up any synopsis of Persuasion and that's what you'll find. But just like in all of Jane Austen's novels, there's so much more going on underneath the surface. And that's why in this video, I want to more closely examine that breakup because I actually have a theory on why she turned him down that I've never heard anyone else talk about before. A couple of things to mention before I make my case in this video. All the things I'm about to say are obviously my opinions, and these opinions are the result of a very close rereading of Persuasion that I just got done with. And also, obviously, I know everyone I'm about to speak about in this video is a literary character. However, Jane Austen wrote characters who were intended to be human beings. She wasn't writing science fiction or fantasy, so her characters hopefully are going to resemble human beings with nuances, with different ways of approaching situations that could potentially happen in real life. Jane Austen had a deep understanding of what makes people tick, and whether she gained that by observation or intuition or more likely a combination of both, her characters act astonishingly like real people. And so throughout this video, I'm going to speak about these characters as though they are real people. I'm going to give psychological insights into them as though they are real people. But don't worry, I'm very aware that they're not. Now, before we talk about Anne, I think it's important that we discuss the larger Elliot family and how Anne grew up. So Anne is actually one of three daughters who were born to Sir Walter Elliot and his wife, Elizabeth. Anne's older sister, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the eldest daughter, Anne herself is the middle daughter, and then Mary is the youngest. A very significant event happened to this family at the turn of the 19th century. Lady Elizabeth Elliot, mother to the three girls, died. And even though her death isn't often spoken about in the book Persuasion, I believe it changed the three Elliot girls and would have major impacts on who they would go on to become. Let's start by discussing the eldest sister, Elizabeth. That bitter beauty who is far too similar to their vain and status-obsessed father and who seems to actively dislike both of her sisters... When Lady Elliot died, Elizabeth would have been 16 years old. So not extremely young, but also not so old as to not need her mother's active involvement anymore. And things for Elizabeth probably changed the most when Lady Elliot died, because it's not just that she lost her mother, but she now had a job to do. She had to take over as lady of the household and start doing those household duties that her mother once did, but she didn't do them as well because she was young and inexperienced. What I think will be important to understand as I go on to make more and more points throughout this video is that the loss of their mother was a trauma for these three girls. And trauma can sometimes have a way of freezing a person in time when it occurred. Elizabeth is not a likable character in this book. She is just downright awful. And I think it's really easy to disregard her because of that dislike. But when you think about what she would have been going through when her mother died, not only is she feeling the loss of her mother, but she probably has to bury that 
deep down inside because now she has work to do. And it's work that she's not necessarily cut out for at such a young age. And we know that's true because her father's spending went out of control after their mother died. Now, that shouldn't be Elizabeth's job to rein in, but it kind of demonstrates that she didn't know what she was doing. She probably hadn't learned a lot from her mother on how to do it. And so I think because she had to grow up and she had to take on this job, that she was not ready for, I think she feels a lot of justified resentment. I also think in some ways that trauma froze her in her teenage years, which if you look at her behavior, it would explain a lot of things about her. It would explain why she's so mean. It would explain why, like a lot of other teenage girls, she seems to prefer her friends, like Mrs. Clay, over her sisters. And I also think the loss of her mother could explain why she's her father's favorite, his shadow, in a way. In the absence of her mother's love and affection, she seems to have sought out her father's. Elizabeth had always been the most beautiful of the three daughters, which already made their extremely shallow father like her the best. And although it's impossible to say if she was snooty and status obsessed before their mother died, I think it's safe to say she probably got worse after the death of Lady Elliot, because I think that was her way of earning more love and affection from her father. She could imitate him. And I think also his way of confidence building, becoming obsessed with his own status, I think became her method of confidence building. Sir Walter Elliot's entire self-image is based on physical appearance and status in society. And I think Elizabeth learned those things directly from him. And I also think those things served as her soft place to fall whenever she went through a hardship. Like we're told right at the beginning of the book that Mr. Elliot had rejected her. And obviously that couldn't have felt good. But in the face of those hardships, she can just convince herself that no, no, she is both more beautiful and more important than everyone involved. And she uses that to soothe the sting away. But now let's talk about the daughter who I actually feel the worst for throughout this book. It's the youngest daughter, Mary. And I know Mary is an unlikable character in this book. She is clingy, she's high strung, she's self-absorbed, and she's a hypochondriac. She's kind of like a Mrs. Bennett in training. But Mary would have been quite young when their mother died, I think around 10 years old. And remember that thing I said about trauma having the ability to freeze someone in time? Yeah, I think that happened to Mary in a big way. As I was rereading Persuasion, I was also consulting this book called Motherless Daughters, The Legacy of Loss by Hope Edelman. And there was a section in the book talking about how adolescent girls can sometimes experience arrested development after the loss of their mother. And I felt it really captured what Mary exhibits throughout Persuasion. The loss of a mother creates a significant developmental challenge for a child. She may be forced to take on responsibility for herself very quickly, causing her to advance some areas of development. At the same time, she may continue to identify with her earlier stage of maturity as a way to maintain a relationship with her mother and deny the finality of death. The result is an adult who retains some characteristics of an earlier developmental time, one who feels as though a piece of her were still stuck in childhood or adolescence. To this daughter, growing up feels not only like a mystery, but also a practical impossibility. She's still too wedded to her childhood. The daughter whose development arrests in some areas may later have trouble emotionally connecting with the tasks and responsibilities normally associated with her chronological age. Without the socializing influence of her mother, she has a difficult time reaching complete intellectual or emotional maturity. Doesn't that sound a lot like Mary? For most of Persuasion, she is very whiny, bratty, just very childlike. And when she is acting like an adult, that's unfortunately when her father's prideful side comes out of her. It's very, very unfortunate. Mary also doesn't make a very good mother because she is very much a child still herself, very self-absorbed in the way that a child is. And she didn't have much exposure to how to be a good mother because she wasn't around 
around her mother for very long before her mother died and Mary was shipped off to school for a long period of time. Mary is stuck in childhood and she is obviously still yearning for closeness with people. She wants to feel connected and close to people. If you look at the majority of her complaints throughout persuasion, a lot of them boil down to the fact that she wants people around her. She'll say things like, no one's been here to see me all morning, or why should I be left alone while all of you go out and have fun? It's almost like she's screaming out to the people she cares about, don't leave me in the way that her mother did by dying. Now you see why I feel the saddest for Mary, and I feel even more that way because Mary, unlike the other two girls, didn't have an alternative to turn to. As we discussed earlier, Elizabeth turned to their father, either as a replacement for their mother or she was already more of a daddy's girl, we can't know. But she had Sir Walter to kind of stick by and be there for her in whatever twisted way he's able to. But Anne, Anne is the one who lucked out most of all, because even before her mother's death, and then definitely while she was grieving her mother, and from then on out, she had a mother substitute, her mother's best friend, her godmother, Lady Russell. In the book Motherless Daughters that I was referencing earlier, there's something else that very commonly occurs after the loss of a parent. One thing that can happen is arrested development. We spoke about that. But something else that can happen is called transference. Because when a girl loses her mother, there is now this giant void in her life, and she wants to fill it. The book says that in order to come out of that grief-stricken period with a normal ability to connect to other people and to avoid feelings of isolation, the young girl may try to quickly and directly transfer her feelings of dependency, her needs, and her expectations onto the nearest available adult. Now, this may also be what happened with Elizabeth and her father, although given his lack of emotional availability, I would say Elizabeth leans more toward the isolated, withdrawn, unable to attach to people side of things. But I do think this is precisely what happened with Anne and Lady Russell. Lady Russell Russell was their mother's best friend. Lady Russell was already Anne's godmother. And Lady Russell already showed a preference for Anne because Anne was the daughter who most closely resembled their mother. So in this time of grief after Lady Elliot died, Lady Russell had lost her best friend, Anne had lost her mother, and I think this was the moment when they really and truly connected. And I can't stress this next thing enough. This is one of the most important things to understand as we move forward in this video. Lady Russell became Anne's mother. Deep down inside, Anne doesn't think about Lady Russell as her aunt, her godmother, her friend, as the book regularly calls her, although at that time, friend could also mean family. But I don't even think the word family is strong enough to define this relationship. And I definitely don't think that calling her a mother substitute defines what Lady Russell is to Anne. At the time when we meet Anne, Lady Russell is Anne's mother. Anne trusts her. She loves her. She confides in her. She tries to hide things from her because she so fears her disapproval. And Lady Russell looks out for Anne. She worries about her. She takes pride in all the goodness of who Anne is as a person. Lady Russell consults Anne when no one else thinks to. Lady Russell gets really upset when people, mainly Anne's family, are unkind or unfair to her. Doesn't this all sound like a mother-daughter relationship. It sounds like one because it is one. Lady Russell adopted Anne after her mother's death. Maybe not in the legal sense, but definitely in the emotional sense. And I need to make this next thing clear because later on, I'm going to make some points that may make it seem like I don't like Lady Russell, and that's not true. I do like Lady Russell. I think she did a damn good job as Anne's mother at the point when she needed her. And ever since, I think she has been a wonderful influence on Anne. I think Anne had a lot of natural goodness. And we're told that Lady Elliot was a really good mother to all three girls before she died. 
But when you look at who Anne is when we meet her at the beginning of this novel, so much of what is good and admirable about her was encouraged or shaped by Lady Russell. Lady Russell is a really good woman. She's classy. She's intelligent. She has a huge heart. She loves the Elliot family like her own. When you pay attention to Lady Russell in this novel, like really pay attention to her, you can see what qualities of hers Anne took on. And they're all great qualities. But Lady Russell, as good of a woman as she is, just like all of our mothers, isn't perfect. First of all, I think she plays favorites. I mean, look at how Elizabeth and Mary turned out. Don't you think it would have been helpful for them to also have Lady Russell be an active part of their lives? Now, I do think that Lady Russell's access to all three girls differed because Elizabeth at the time of Lady Elliot's death would have been busy running the household. And I think even then would have been probably fairly closed off to the open relationship that I think Lady Russell wanted to have with the girls. And then Mary, when their mother died, was shipped off to school. So even though Lady Russell had more access to Anne, obviously it made the most sense that the two of them would become as close as they did. But I do think she chose to be with Anne after that period of time because she had her preference. The main flaw that Lady Russell has that Jane Austen does point out, but she doesn't really underscore it all that much is the fact that Lady Russell herself invests a little bit too much in the idea of status. She is not nearly as bad as Sir Walter Elliot, which I think sometimes drowns out this quality about her because we have this other example of a character who is so all about it. It can sometimes be easy to forget that Lady Russell also has those ideas in her head, but she does put way more emphasis on the idea of social rank than a lot of other characters in this book do including Anne. At the time Anne agreed to marry Wentworth, she was only 19 years old. And so I think at that time in her life, she would have had very few, if any, opportunities to come up against a situation that would expose her to Lady Russell's bias, that would make her aware of it. And I do think it was Lady Russell's bias that eventually made her talk Anne out of going forward with the engagement. And it was Lady Russell who did that. Anne's father didn't approve of the match. He made that very clear. But Anne didn't really care if it made him happy or not. Because Sir Walter never liked Anne. Anne never liked him back. I mean, in concept, I know she loves both her father and her older sister, Elizabeth. She loves both of them because they're family, but she doesn't really like them. And she doesn't really care if they approve of her life choices. So it was never her father who she was afraid of offending, but she did fear disappointing the woman who became her mother, Lady Russell. I think it was that incident that opened up Anne's eyes to who Lady Russell is, what she values, what she's all about. And I think from that point forward, she changed the way she made decisions. I think she decided, no longer am I just going to do what Lady Russell tells me. I will factor in what she thinks, but I am going to have the say at the end of the day. Because I think Anne knew probably almost immediately that she had made a mistake in turning down Wentworth. Throughout the novel, we still see Anne turning to Lady Russell for advice, consulting her on different things. It's not as though Anne thinks, oh, you gave me one bad piece of advice, so I'm never going to talk to you again. No, it's that Anne has learned the skill of weighing opinions appropriately. She still trusts Lady Russell. Lady Russell obviously has her best interest at heart, but Anne now knows that she is the only one who is going to know what truly makes her happy. So she weighs those opinions accordingly. I think Anne learned that skill very early on after breaking Wentworth's heart, because only a few years later, she turned down another marriage proposal, this time from Charles Musgrove, who we learn, we meet him in the book, he's a perfectly nice man. It would have been a decent match for Anne, at least status wise. But Anne knew that he wasn't her match intellectually. And that really mattered to her. But that was very upsetting for Lady Russell. Lady Russell wanted her to accept him. And also, it's very difficult for Lady Russell later in the book to accept that Mr. Elliot, with all his 
outwardly deceptive social graces isn't who he presents himself to be. But both of those times, Anne overruled her. So Anne isn't as persuadable as Wentworth may think if we look at those two examples. It's just that she was immature and unaware of Lady Russell's bias, which would have been against Wentworth and his lack of money and status at the time of the first proposal. But is that all it took for Anne to turn down the love of her life? The fact that the woman who was effectively her mother said not to because of his lack of money and status, which we find out through this novel, don't mean all that much to Anne. I think there's one more piece to this puzzle. I think that Lady Russell, who again, I believe is a good woman and I think was coming from a good place, I think Lady Russell manipulated Anne into saying no. And I think that because when the breakup is being discussed, Austin says of Anne, but it was not merely selfish caution under which she acted in putting an end to it. Had she not imagined herself consulting his good even more than her own, she could hardly have given him up. The belief of being prudent and self-denying principally for his advantage was her chief consideration under the misery of a parting. It's entirely unclear why Anne thinks it would be in Wentworth's best interest for her to cast him off. I mean, maybe it was the fact that he didn't have the money to support a wife yet, but I don't even think that's a compelling argument because I think having Anne at home as his intended or as his wife would have compelled Wentworth to work even harder to advance in the Navy. When I first read that section, I found it really frustrating because Anne doesn't provide provide any reasoning behind why it would have been in Wentworth's best interest for them not to go forward with the engagement. I found that really confusing, especially because she seems so convinced of it even eight years later. But then I thought about it some more. And I think the reason why she holds on to that idea so tightly is because that is how Lady Russell convinced her to give him up years and years ago. This next question is directed to all the daughters with close relationships to their mothers out there. Who knows you better than your mom? Probably no one. Anne and Lady Russell are very tight-knit. They're very close. They have been ever since Anne's mother died, and they were probably pretty close even before then. Lady Russell knows Anne. She knows what Anne values. And therefore, Lady Russell knows that above all else, Anne wants to be useful. Anne considers other people first before herself. And so she knows that it would absolutely rip apart Anne's insides to think that anyone, especially the man she loves, would suffer on account of her. So what would be the surefire way to get Anne to turn down a man who Lady Russell frankly didn't like? Not only did she find him to be lowly and poor, again her biases come into play there, but also she found him arrogant and she didn't want her baby girl married to him. Lady Russell had to convince Anne that it would be in Wentworth's best interest to turn him down. I don't think anything else would have convinced her. I felt sure this was the case during that scene when we finally get to see Lady Russell in action, trying to convince Anne to do something. She is trying to persuade Anne to see Mr. Elliot, Anne's cousin, as a serious marriage prospect. And Anne keeps saying no during this conversation. No, I don't trust him. No, we wouldn't be well suited. But then Lady Russell pulls out the ace. She stops Anne in her tracks when Lady Russell says that it would fill her heart with joy to get to see Anne take her mother's place as Lady Elliot of Kellynch. That idea, that image is so tempting and enticing to Anne that she puts aside all of her concerns and really considers it. And it was that moment that I realized Lady Russell is good. She knows Anne. She knows what will appeal to her. So she knows the right thing to say to get Anne to really take 
her position seriously, and it worked. But the moment that Anne shooed away that lovely picture in her head is the biggest demonstration of growth in this book, because we got to see what may have been a very similar tactic to what Lady Russell had used eight and a half years prior. But this time, Anne stood her ground. I think Anne needed to go through something like this with Lady Russell in order to mature and become her own woman. Firstly, I think she needed to see Lady Russell for who she actually was. A good woman, but one with biases and preferences, just like everybody else. And also, young women mature a lot as they start to distance themselves from their mothers. It starts to become this process of identifying where your mother ends and you begin. You get to look at your own qualities when you're separated from your mother and say, okay, what inside of me did I get from my mother? But where do we differ? And I think as a young woman approaching 30, Anne now sees that. She loves Lady Russell. She values her. But Anne knows at this point in her life, that she is the one who is responsible for her own happiness and knows what it will take for her to get there. But that doesn't mean that Anne doesn't want a strong, close relationship with Lady Russell for years to come. In fact, I think Anne makes a very in-character self-sacrifice at the end of the novel when she's trying to convince Wentworth that, no, no, I made the right choice in saying no to you all those years ago because now we're so happy. I think Anne is telling a little bit of a fib at that point. I think she knows it was the wrong choice. I think she knew that even way back when. But what does she want most in that moment? She wants the man who she loves and the woman she loves as her mother to love each other. And so in order to facilitate that, she does a very human thing and does a little bit of a revisionist history. But that was my take on the psychology of Anne Elliot and what may have convinced her to turn Wentworth down. Again, these are just my opinions, educated ones, but opinions no less. I would love to hear what you think about all of this in the comment section below. And if you would like to keep up with what I am reading and writing about right now, you can find me on a variety of places around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram, where I'm the most active. The links to all of my profiles will be at the bottom of the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.